There's some dangerous large uh, carnivore out there. Yeah, I saw that bird pick a young deer off the bank and fly away. And uh, it was just about getting dark, and we started panicking, running down this ridge, not really having any clue what was throwing rocks in our vicinity, good-sized rocks. And uh, I stopped long enough to get a 357 out of my backpack and look back, and that's when I saw it. I saw one. Uh, for a week, the, the town's defiance was harassed by a werewolf. And it's actually attacked two railroad workers, uh, killed livestock. You know, just a lot of weird stuff that was going on. Good Sunday evening, Monster Xers. This is Gunnar Monson, your host for Monster X Radio and the founder of the Sasquatch Coffee Company. Sasquatch Coffee, have you tried it yet? You can check it out at www.squatchcoffee.com. With me today, as always, is my good friend and the consummate Bigfoot researcher, Shane Hardcore Corson. Shane, how are you, buddy? Uh, good as always, Gunnar. Good as always. Glad to be here. And- Looking forward to talking to uh, our guests this evening. I hear you. Uh, did you get out? I, I know you were able to uh, go to Hopsquatch on Friday. I was not able to make it out. And Cliff Bar- Barackman was the, the guest speaker. How was how was that evening? <clears throat> really, uh, uh, just a blast. It's always it's always great to hear. Uh, you know, Cliff Talk and uh, Guy Edwards, you know, put on another stellar event, packed house, uh, standing room, and uh, Cliff put on a, a really good presentation, uh, basically um, revolving around areas that he likes to look at and why he picks those areas. So, I, I you know, he's going to be speaking up at the upcoming um, Ohio conference. I think this is going to be, I think this presentation at Hopsquatch is going to be a little bit different than what he's going to be um, sharing uh, at the Ohio conference, but which which is nice. And uh, really, uh, you know, it was a lot of fun uh, hearing from Cliff. And, of course, Packed House got to meet some new people, uh, catch up with some old friends. And uh, yeah, overall, it was a great time, another stellar event put on by Guy. And uh, just a blast all around. Got some information there and in, in context, as, as I usually do it you know, uh, guys' events. So um, kudos to Guy and kudos to Cliff for another stellar event. Well, that's good. Uh, I, I was sorry to miss it. I, I uh, saw Cliff present on uh, footprints, you know, in casting and, and, the, and some history back uh, backed up uh, on footprints and stuff in different areas. And, and it was, I don't know, that's been, that's been a good year ago, I think. And, and it was... Mm-hmm. Cliff always is, you know, a wealth of information. So, uh, wealth of yeah, wealth I'm of sorry information. Missed it, so. yeah. yeah, wealth of information, and, and he, um, you know, he, he, you know, you know, we we know Cliff well, and so it's it's uh, we have access to Cliff, but a lot of people don't, and this was a good avenue and and <clears throat> situation where people could talk to Cliff, ask him questions. <clears throat> pardon me, and then after <clears throat> his talk. You know, people were able to uh, mingle with him a little bit and pick his brain and just get to know, you know, Cliff Berkman uh, a little more than you, you know, see on TV or and whatnot. So it was a, 
good venue, and, and I know Cliff enjoyed it. Uh, got to hang out with Cliff afterwards, and you know he enjoyed it and, and got a lot out of it. He always does, and he's very personable. Uh, uh, you know, and there's a lot more to Cliff than uh, the Finding Bigfoot show. Trust me. <laughs> yeah, no, he he's had an actual you know researcher investigator for a long time. So um, it's funny because you know people think that these the char- their characters on TV and to, they play up their you know different parts, but but Cliff, I know Cliff, Bobo, you know uh, Matt, they they actually do go Bigfoot researching when they're not on TV. So um, exactly, very, yeah. yeah. yeah so <laughs> and we had Cliff, uh, of course, we had Cliff on the show a couple of weeks back, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, that was a really informative show. And fortunately, uh, <clears throat> we had the opportunity. Uh, some of the OP members to take Cliff up to our, the nesting site that uh, has been located uh, for you know as a possibility. Very interesting area. Cliff enjoyed being up there. So uh, it's been a, a fun few weeks uh, uh, having Cliff uh, on the show and seeing him in person and hanging out. So cool. Well, our guests today are are from uh, Squatch Unlimited or Surge and. Uh, we're going to pick their brains about what this uh, team squatching has been up to. Um, Rob Goudet and, uh, excuse me, Melissa Adair are our guests today. So let's bring Rob and Melissa on. Hey, guys. How you doing? Hey, we're doing great. How are you guys doing? I'm warm. It's, it's a scorching 70 seven degrees here in, on the Oregon coast today. So. <laughs> That's awesome. So, Rob and, and Melissa, thanks for joining us today. Um, for folks that aren't familiar with uh, what you guys do, um, Squatch Unlimited and Slash Surge, can you t- give us a little bit of uh, background? How did it come to be and, and what are you about? <laughs> Melissa, I'll let you. I'll let you tell. I usually <laughs> talk to him and take all the take all the radio time. Why don't you go ahead and see if you can remember everything we rehearsed? Okay. Um, <laughs> so okay. Well, uh, Squatch Unlimited um, came together, I guess, many many moons ago um, after the Bigfoot Chick phenomenon died out because we lost the Bigfoot Chick and Rob had to become a Bigfoot Chick and it just wasn't working. So. Um, so we uh, we rebranded ourselves Squatch Unlimited, and now we're the Squatch Unlimited Research Group, which is Surge. And we research primarily along the Gulf States region. Um, it also includes parts of um, Oklahoma, Southeast Oklahoma, and North Texas. And um, we, you know, we investigate reports um, from all over the, those um, those areas. On our website, we also have um, a massive database of um, of cryptid sightings dating back as early as 1700s. Um, so we we do a lot of research with those um, things as well. We also, um, I guess, uh, we attempt to document a lot of our research as well, and that's landed us into some projects, and we've done some projects with Dr. Meldrum um, and, uh, you know, researching some of these older cryptid reports and such. Um, one of the things, I guess, that makes us a little bit different that um, we uh, – um, are known for, I guess, is, uh, is some of the baiting that we do and some of the re- results that we've got um, as a result of it. Uh, we we put out a lot of um, things that have a really strong smell. We use jello powder. We'll throw it out. We'll, we'll, whatever area we determine we're going to go into um, after kind of looking at reports and lining up the time of year and, um, and the closeness to water and all that kind of thing. When we pick a good research spot, um, and an area that's real close to known sightings. We'll go out, you know, uh, before before dusk, and we'll throw out some Jello powder because there's a really strong smell, um, or some garlic powder, or some coffee, or, or things like that. We'll, we'll, we'll play around with different things, but primarily Jello powder because it's such a strong scent. And you know, we'll go back into that area several hours later after the sunset, and you can smell it really, really strong. And we've had some really interesting results doing that. Um, one of the really um, exciting things that we had happen was in northern Alabama when we did that uh, place where we were camping. There was a, I don't know, probably three different trails going in three different directions from the area that we were camping along a river. 
and we put garlic on one trail, coffee on one trail, and jello on the other trail. And uh, there were some hikers, you know, during that day um, that we were there. And that night, our camp was the only camp there. There's nobody else there. And uh, probably around midnight, we heard this giant rock clack. And, I mean, there's, there was nobody around. We were in the middle of nowhere. And, um, you know, we, we were just kind of sitting by the fire, and everybody just, just jumped up. I mean, it scared all of us because it was so loud. And, um, you know, no, nothing really happened after that. But the next morning when we were walking around, we found these footprints um, that went through the, the creek bed up the other side, and they were way down, like, in a 20-foot ravine, so it wasn't easy to get to. And it was a good, I don't know, 30, it was in the – upper 30s, lower 40s that night. So it was really, really cold. I mean, you wouldn't think, you know, just the normal average Joe would be walking around barefoot in the in the creek bed. So that was really, really exciting. Um, other times we've tried it in other locations and gotten really interesting noises and such. But anyway, um, we do that, and, and then we do a lot of um, a lot of filming, a lot of documenting of our work as well. And we have a lot of YouTube videos up on our on our channel, and um, we just kind of check, check out the Southern Squatch. Yeah, you guys have it. So you guys have a Facebook group, and then you have your your, your uh, website. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, uh, the, the Facebook group and the website? Go ahead, Rob. Sure. Um, well, you know, this is <clears throat> when you're not when you can't be in the woods twenty four seven. Unfortunately, a lot of us would love to be able to do that, and um, <clears throat> a Facebook group is a, a great way. I know. Most Bigfooters are on probably a hundred different groups, as I know I am. Um, <clears throat> so obviously, we it was a natural thing to set up our own our own Facebook group. <clears throat> um, we try to we try to strike a tone of reality and fairness um, to anybody who comes into the group. Um, it's really important from our perspective to take everybody at their word, even. You know, even things where people say, oh, it's a hoax, you know, kind of our philosophy is, okay, we'll prove it's a hoax. <laughs> I mean, uh, there's, <clears throat> you know, you have, to, you have to back up what you say, whether you come in and say you have, you know, a photo of something and it's, you know, you, you believe it to be something. You have to, you have to back up why you believe it to be something. Well, you have to back up why you believe it to not be something, too. Um, and so... I think it's important because it creates a safe area for people to come in and discuss things without fear of being ridiculed. Um, you know, we just we just really don't um, we don't allow ideas or way out there theories to be ridiculed. You know, um, I think it's it's important to keep an open mind, but <clears throat> at the same time, um, we're okay with opinions um, as long as you state it as an opinion. You can say. You know, you can say you can come in our group and you can say, "I really believe that it's a hoax." Well, okay, in, you know, in my opinion, that is a hoax. Well, good, you, you have a right to your, your opinion. But it's another thing to come in and say that is a hoax. <laughs> they're they're two different things, and so that really, it, you know, if you want to understand Squatch Unlimited and who what we try to do, um, you know, we get into the the definition of. Um, what is fact and what is just your personal belief, and we really try to keep them separate. It's important. So that's our group, and everybody's welcome to come in and, and have fun and, you know, post memes and videos and photos, um, but, you know, always be respectful. Um, the website is a natural thing. <clears throat> Myself being a programmer um, and having been involved in Internet technologies for over 20 years, you know, putting what we know on the web is, was a natural progression um, I actually took the John Green database that he donated basically to the world, which was an access database. Um, and if anybody you know n understands normalization and looked at his database, you realized it was not normalized, which means it was just kind of a, a mix of data that was wasn't very easy to mine. Well, I took John Green's database <clears throat> and normalized it, where I took certain certain um, aspects and characteristics from reports and pulled them into their own tables. Um, and so it made it much more um, user-friendly. It let me build a front end that made it searchable. And, it, I mean, I, I really turned it into a basic report database that other things could be added to as well. And so <clears throat> that feature is actually not up on our site right now because I, my, I lost my server. 
<laughs> I haven't reinstalled it. Um, I haven't reinstalled that site after the hosting company blasted my server and really made me kind of not really happy with them. But um, I need to reinstall it, and once it's up, anybody listening is going to be able to go on and, and search John Green's database in a normalized manner. And it just gives some really fascinating information and details. Like I could I could tell you how many um, how many Bigfoot were shot out of John Green's database, how many um, encounters included two or more creatures, um, just all kind of interesting things that you wouldn't, you know, that go beyond just, oh, it, it, you know, we saw one and this is what it looked like. I don't, I can let you analyze similar type reports as well. So like I said, right. that feature is not up right now, but once it's back up, it'll be accessible at squatchunlimited.org. Um, but we have probably five or 600 members on Squatch Unlimited website now and it's really just a place for people to come and post stories and upload photos and and really see some of the stuff we've done as well so that's our that's our kind of our technology side yeah it's really interesting that you 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 set out to normalize john green's database uh i hope you get that up back up uh i think that's that's fantastic uh talk about uh one of the uh forefathers true pioneers of uh the subject that we all seek uh, and that's truly uh, a really great endeavor to partake in, and I'm, I'm glad you've done that. I hope to uh, see it up soon, uh, something I would uh, refer back to. But, you know, I, I refer back to John Green all the time. Normalize, you know, where you can yeah. kind of look at things a little more clear and, and research a little easier, uh, that would be phenomenal. He had fantastic data. He had information about the weather, the terrain, the type of bushes that were around. And so um, by taking and doing it the way that I did it, <clears throat> it grouped, um, you know, if if you wanted to see all the encounters where it was in a, a piney forest, you could do it on um, on the normalization feature that I added. And so it is, it's, it's really cool. Um, and uh, I do need to, I need to take some time and push it back up. It wouldn't take me long. I just need to do it. One of the interesting things about <clears throat> that database is it kind of stops. I mean, at the point that he stopped entering information into that database, I don't remember exactly, but I want to say it was in the 90s. And so then there's a gap between there and whenever we kind of start putting in our information in. So you can kind of see – I mean, the Bigfoot craze really did take off again probably in the early 2000s or mid-2000s probably, probably about 2005. And so – all of the noise that happened after the internet came around isn't in this database. It's all based on firsthand accounts, which mm-hmm. makes it again gives you it gives it a different feel because it's done on a more personal level versus um, there's no you know, there's very little hostility in it. It's more of a um, an informative type approach to collecting data, and so it gives an interesting feel to it. Right. Yeah. I mean. Like I said, you know, John Green, fantastic. I mean, that that database. Uh, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, it's like over 3,000 different sighting and track reports, mm-hmm. and it's a huge database. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, phenomenal. And yeah. for the listeners that don't know, I mean, John Green, uh, he, like I said, is one of the true pioneers, and you know, he worked with people like Renee DeHinden and and many others, and uh, collected this database that is, yeah. uh, you know, profound, profound. Yeah. Well, fantastic. I hope hope to see that up there. Uh, you know, you guys, one of your um, your your objective or your mission statement, and I'll read it real quick here, uh, to contribute to the greater good of the species, foster a spirit of cooperation, and a message of conservation with the research community, and experience this mystery for ourselves. I, lo- I like the statement. Uh, what does that mean, though? I mean. Uh, Mm-hmm. You know, to 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 the general public, what, that's your mission statement. Can you elaborate a little bit about it? I don't have it right in front of me, but um, to kind of paraphrase it, one of the right. one of the things you know, like I said, we try to create a safe place where people and groups, um, um, you know, you, you, you <laughs> I, I felt like people would have an experience, and I mean, the first thing right away, you know, when people are afraid of being ridiculed for what what had happened to them. And so, you know, and then if they come on our sites or they come on our Facebook group and they read people um, criticizing or ridiculing um, posts or photos or whatever, 
then that turns that's that's going to suppress information from people that have had something happen to them and so kind of the the fostering cooperation that's where that really comes from um the um i mean the, the all of it is really around you know and and the reality is i mean there's we we have our own altruistic reasons for doing it and we also have our own selfish reasons for doing this we want to experience this mystery for ourselves that's why we go into the woods and do the things that we do we want to hear the tree knock we want to um have something yell back at us you know in in the middle of the night um and so you know it I think it, um, you know, th- those are all the true reasons why we do this and why we do it from a technology perspective and why we hop in our car or hop on a plane and and go to some place where we think um, there's a good chance that there may be um, something still around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in some of these areas, I mean, uh, I, I don't, you know, can you guys elaborate on, you know, Melissa or Rob, uh, some of those key areas that you really do uh, feel that Sasquatch is in? You know, I mean, uh, Melissa, I believe you're out in Georgia, so, you know, some of the bordering states are Florida, you know, the, the Carolinas, both north and south, Alabama, Tennessee. Uh, you know, uh, do you guys focus in uh, primarily in those areas? I know you said Oklahoma and, and, and I think north Texas, uh, but uh, why – are those areas you guys key in on? And also, why would a Sasquatch be in those areas? I mean, what, what have you guys found and who have you talked to to, you know, have you guys got any, um, you know, ideas as to why? Um, well, uh, let's see. Uh, southeast Oklahoma, there's definitely Squatches there. Northeast Texas, there's definitely Squatches there. Um, you know, there's just, there, there's thousands, you know, well, maybe not thousands, but hundreds of reports um, in those particular areas, we've done a lot of um, a lot of research in those those two areas. We've also done um, a fair amount of research in Mississippi and Alabama, um, and uh, you know, I, I personally have have talked with um, with eyewitnesses in in the um, in the Alabama Georgia region. Um, you know, just big burly um, hunters in a couple of cases, and then just um, just a regular ordinary you know, a young young lady in her twenties who was a nurse who just happened to live um up against the wood line and, and all of these people were they grew up near the woods, they hunted in the woods, they were very comfortable in the woods and then, you know, they described this encounter that you know, I witnessed I mean they they saw the creature in light, um and and it was just, you know, it forever changed them and just to to look in their eyes when they tell the story and to um and just to, to listen how their their voice change and the emotion in their voice when they talk. Um, you know, these people had an experience. They saw something that that just shook them to their core, and um, it's just and it, and it changed their behavior. I mean, like these big burly men that walk around carrying you know guns and rifles that grew up that way. They're so comfortable hunting. They won't go in the woods anymore. Um, and you know, this this young woman that I talked to that's right here in Georgia, very near where I live. Um, you know, she, she, you know, she wanted to sell her home and move into the city. She didn't want to be with it. It scared her to death, you know, after having these experiences. Um, so, you know, I, I definitely, I definitely think they're here. Um, and, and also in, in the North Texas and, and Oklahoma, Oklahoma regions, there's um, very similar reports um, that, that we've read um, there and different stories that we've heard from people that we've met. Um, out there, why would they be in these regions? I, you know, in the in the southeast, you know, there's it's so there's lots of pine forest in the southeast, um, and that's the one thing that um, that almost makes to me of all the different places I've gone around the country, it's almost the scariest place for me um, because in the pine forest it is so quiet. <laughs> Um, there's no leaf litter really because there's so many pine needles and it's just it's so soft and it's so quiet and and I mean I've even tested it during daylight I've, I've stationed people at different different points in the forest and I've hidden behind a tree and then radioed for them to start walking to see if I could hear them and they I mean they got basically like five feet from me and I didn't even know they were there so it's I mean and if, if a human can do that and be that stealthy even when you know just just walking a normal gait and not trying to be quiet. Can you imagine a creature that's, you know, 
you know, thrives on being elusive and how close they can get, how much they can, how close they can get and really, really watch what you're doing. So I don't know, in the southeast, I think it's ideal because there's so many little streams and tributaries, plentiful wildlife, tons of deer, um, you know, it, 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 we have bear everywhere around in these areas. If it can support bear, I would think it would be able to support a squash as well. Um, and so they can move about um, up and down the, those waterways in that pine forest and just not make a sound. I think that's ideal. Um, it's similar in, in Oklahoma and North Texas. Um, there's not as much pine, but there's just so many waterways and so much wildlife. Um, and then just so many vast areas that are away from roads and away from people. I mean, you can get really, really remote in those areas. It's crazy. And, um, you know, you, you know, there, you could probably put a whole city back in there and never even know it was there because it's just so remote in some of those, those, um, those places. But, um, yeah, I definitely, I think, I think there's habitat to support in, in all of those areas in the, in the Southeast and, and Gulf States region. And, um, definitely, um, plenty of reports and plenty of eyewitness interviews um, that, that we've personally made and then, and then also read about that, that really support that they're there. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think people truly appreciate uh, the, the amount of vast forests and uninhibited areas in the continental, you know, United States, North America in general, uh, where it's very easy to... Uh, um, very easy to get lost, very easy to, you know, these, a lot of these areas are so vast and so uh, just huge. It, it, to me, uh, when I go out to places like Mount Hood out here in Oregon or, or the Olympics, you can look out on a uh, mountain peak and just view so much terrain that is just pristine. I don't think people really, uh, they can't fathom uh, unless they've been out there the vast wilderness. I mean, do you guys agree? I mean, areas back, you know, east and whatnot, yeah. you guys are in the same boat. Yeah, no, I think most people, you know, and I, it's almost arrogant of man, of a modern man. I'm standing here in my backyard, you know, in a neighborhood. Um, there's trees all around, and I can hear somebody mowing their lawn. I mean, if we will go drive 10 miles to the south or 10 miles to the west from where I live, um, you're in the middle of a swamp. And People never do that, they, and so you can get lost. I mean, you, I, I could drive 10 miles. If you dropped me off and didn't tell me where I was, I could get lost, and you would never find me. Um, and we we live right on the edge of um, a vast um, amounts of land. I mean, remoteness that one, I mean, being dropped off two miles in is enough to get lost in. And so, you know, <clears throat> we're kind of we're arrogant and that we think that there's, you know, for, for people that just are refuse to believe something like this can exist. I mean, common sense, if you are aware of the amount of um, remote, uninhabited wilderness that's out there, I mean, the common sense says they must exist. Just, you know, from basic evolution, <laughs> there needs to be something between the, the bear and man, you know. And so um, – it, it, it's it's really arrogant of us to not have an open mind and and think that something can exist out there. Um, you know, the other thing about <clears throat> the Gulf Coast area is the it's really a very moderate um, climate. Um, it's not you know in the winter. I mean, here heck, I'm in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I live <clears throat> about a mile from the Mississippi River. Actually, I actually walked out there today. There's a trail that goes to the river from my house, and um, I think this summer, it, the coldest – I mean, it got into the 30s once or twice, I guess, this winter. Um, but, you know, generally, it was it was very nice. And so, you know, the climate here is much more conducive to um, not only Sasquatch, but all of the other types of animals out there that, that – would be needed to support a food chain that would support a larger um, mammal of some kind. So, <clears throat> you know, the, and the other thing about this region is people, I was watching Finding Bigfoot the other day and they were in Mississippi and people really don't talk that much about their experiences either. Um, and so, you know, there's probably for every encounter that you would hear in the Gulf Coast region, Louisiana, Mississippi, probably Alabama, um, you're probably going to only hear 
one out of maybe five. Um, and I get messages, I get emails, um, Facebook, Facebook messages from people that have things happen that never get reported, they never get documented. And I get these all the time. <clears throat> so, you know, it's, um, it, it really is staggering the amount of information that's out there if somebody is willing to um, dig for it and also, you know, just use a little bit of common sense and um, get out of your house and go and, and see what is 10 miles, you know, 10 miles outside the city. You'll be amazed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, truly amazed. Uh, I told people the same thing out here uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, get out there uh, and, and just enjoy it, but you know, uh, keep an open mind uh, and and just realize you know where you're at and how vast some of these forests are. Uh, it's truly amazing. There's a lot of discoveries, Sasquatch, Bigfoot aside, cryptid aside, to be found out there. Uh, you know, it's it's the ocean, but on land. Uh, there's still a lot of amazing discoveries yeah. to be found there for sure. There really are. But there really is. But so. Do you guys, uh, back uh, towards the east, do you guys see, uh, what's your opinion on the variation of Sasquatch reports? Uh, Are you guys seeing, do you guys believe or see um, that there is, um, are we dealing with the same creature? Uh, You know, a lot of reports around the country vary, you know, you get reports that, you know, these things vary in size, um, girth, and the whole nine. Are you guys seeing... Any variation? Do you think we're dealing with the same creature or or different type of creatures, possibly? Uh, what's your feelings and thoughts on that? It's the Celtic squatches down here. You know, it's, we're all of Irish descent, so they're they all have red hair down here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Um, no, it's interesting yeah. you say that. Um, I'll just mm-hmm. say this about the red hair real quick, Melissa. I was um, I was at the. This is something that. Um, well, I'll tell you, I was I was at the Finding Bigfoot Town Hall in um, Lufkin, Texas, which is um, not far from um, the Big Thicket. And the report, I was listening to the people stand up and give their their encounter for the camera, and I kept hearing something that was just really interesting to me. And um, I actually brought this up with the cast later. We were at the hotel with them, talking to them, and um, but everybody was talking about how they saw an auburn or a red colored creatures. And I probably heard four or five different people say that. And it was interesting. <clears throat> the cast really didn't pick up on it, which I was, and I, cause I mentioned it to them at, and the, um, downstairs in the lobby and they're like, Oh yeah, right. We, uh, we didn't even think about that, but it was right. And so, you know, to have all of those reports and have, all these people seeing kind of the same color and describing it the same way was really interesting to me. Um, but that was just, I think one of the characteristics of the, of the Sasquatches in that part of the, of Texas, which is Southeast Texas, um, was that they're Auburn or red colored or some of a certain number of them are. Yeah. Do you think um, that might, do do you think that might have, Something to do with the the foliage for for camouflage down there. Um, you know, it it very well could. I mean, um, there, I don't know if we have enough information to say for sure, but yeah, I mean, the pine straw is everywhere. I mean, my, I'm looking, standing in the bed right now, and my flower beds is what we use to keep weeds from growing. Um, and so uh, it would make sense, right? That Mm-hmm. they would kind of like a chameleon, you know, through DNA or through genetics. Um, you know, the characteristics of their hair would pick up based on the area that they're in. So, yeah, I could see that being very real. I know the um, there's a lot of clay in that part of the country, too, and the clay is red. So, <clears throat> you know, maybe it's just, maybe it's not natural, or maybe it's not the hair itself. Maybe it's them um, with mud caked on their hair and the mud picked up through the hair. I don't know. I mean, we don't have enough information, like I said, to be for sure. But it could it definitely has something to do with the foliage or the or the mud in the area, though. It really that would make right. a lot of sense. Yeah, I find that I find that interesting because uh, you know one of the areas I I do a lot of research in, and it's well documented way before my time 
is the Clackamas uh, River drainage up uh, towards Mount Hood up here in the Pacific Northwest. And a lot of the um, Sasquatch sighting reports reflect that, uh, that they're auburn colored, almost a reddish kind of color. Uh, and uh, once again, you have a lot of the pine needle, um, the floor flooring, you know, these dead pine needles and stuff in this area. Um, but a lot of the reports uh, reflect this, this auburn colored Sasquatch. And usually, too, may I, I'll add, uh, usually juvenile and young, or at least what is assumed to be, because they're sometimes they're tall and thin or smaller. So I, I find that correlation kind of interesting. So maybe there's something to it. Maybe there's not. Mm hmm. But, uh, you know, I mean, are you guys seeing like a, hu a huge variation uh, uh, in, you know, put coloring, you know, uh, hair color and whatnot aside? Uh, any other variations mm -hmm. that you're seeing, I mean, uh, that would that would kind of uh, separate the two, you know, or well, I won't say two, but different sides of the country. There's a lot of reports out there, and some are very similar, and some just stand out where they're, you're like, Is this, are we talking about the same thing? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I, I, I would, both. I'll let you go ahead and say, but I'll just say I think there's two different creatures. I, I think there's a the bipedal canine and a the Bigfoot. So we can talk about that later. But mostly, go ahead and say what you're going to say. No, I was going to say. Well, I so said there's that possibility. Like Rob just said that um, it's a different species. Or, or um, but I was going to say most of the reports that we're seeing um, in the southeast um, area. They're either red or they're or they're brown, but the brown is kind of a light brown that could easily be like that auburn color, probably based on on the reports and then the people that I've talked to. And it seems like um, of the reports I've read from the Pacific Northwest, they seem to be more more they seem to be bigger and they're all black. Um, you know, they're the, more of them are reported as black. And then I have friends in the Northeast, and they've even um, they've even described some white ones, like all white, which um, which I found fascinating. Um, so, but, you know, every, all the other characteristics that they were describing were the same, you know, that the, the, you know, no neck, the wide, wide shoulders, um, you, you know, just the way the hair fell on the face and the, and the arms and everything, it just sounded like the same creature, but it was white, um, you know, and it, it, obviously it could be albino, but there were several of them seen, so it just kind of makes you wonder, um, you know, if it's not, I don't know, do we have different breeds of these things or is it, um, is it um, an age thing? Yeah, and so you know, who, who knows? Like, there's just not enough information to know right. for sure. But I was gonna say, in the southeast, we're of all the reports that I've seen and heard about, they're primarily either brown or that red brown, that um, you know, like an auburn kind of color. So not not a huge thing. But yeah, there, there are a number of reports, like Rob pointed out, that kind of make you go, hmm, it's not quite not quite matching up with what we know to be a Bigfoot sighting, and maybe it's something else. And, uh, so there's always that possibility as well. Right. And one of the things I always think about when I'm looking around the country of these different reports is, uh, so you got a witness um, or witnesses, and, uh, of course, you know, similar north to west, uh, the terrain is a lot different than the terrain back east and some of these other eastern states. And so – you know, perhaps they're seeing the same thing, uh, but they're not, you know, we have different uh, fauna. We have, you know, different um, areas of interest and whatnot, but perhaps they're, they're describing the same thing as best they can, but given, you know, a lot of people compare stuff to what they know. And so perhaps uh, they're witnessing the same thing, but comparing it to, you know, something that's in their area, a known animal or, you know, whatnot, or given the terrain and whatnot. So uh, discretion is always uh, used when I look at these reports, and maybe they're just describing it based on where they grew up and how they grew up and what they know, and we could be still looking at the same sort of uh, individuals or, or species. But then again, um, like you guys mentioned before, uh, some of them just stand out where they're completely different, and uh, in, and there are multiple reports of them, and that to me, I go, hmm, are we talking about the same thing? Perhaps not. I don't know. But it's truly interesting, mm -hmm. truly interesting, and uh, definitely a lot of questions out there because uh, people are seeing stuff, and uh, there's enough of them out there that uh, there's something going on. 
in these states in 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 North America. Um, what are some of the uh, you guys I, w- I could imagine have went you know interviewed a ton of uh, individuals uh, whether they've had a sighting or an encounter or experienced something weird. Any of those uh, people that you guys have interviewed, any of those particular um, reports have they stood out to you? Anything that kind of got the hair up on your your neck a little bit uh, anybody that stood out to you that you were like wow this guy's telling or this girl's telling the truth and uh that's crazy that's strange anything that uh, you guys yeah. want to share yeah yeah um, i have a couple of stories <laughs> um <clears throat> i'll i'll just tell you i um honestly the the strangest one to me um is a guy that lives um just north in north louisiana um, his name is randy miller um, he, uh, he was coming back, I don't know, school, school function or something with his daughter and his wife and their kids. Um, there was three kids and two adults and they're in their car and they live on a, I don't know, maybe like 15 acres of land right off of a, a highway, not a, not an interstate, but just a busy highway in North Louisiana. And, um, he has a, a, a mechanic shop on, on his property. He, he works on cars. And um, then they live in an older house, you know, on piers, um, probably, you know, built in the ni- early 1900s probably. And um, But then they have a field behind the house, and he would pull in to his – he'd pull into his house, and he'd kind of make a wide berth and then go back into the back of his garage, his shop and where he, is where he would park. And um, they were coming back from the school function, and he said that he pulled into his driveway and was turning – and he said the headlights caught something running on four legs through his field, and he stopped for a minute. He thought it was a hog until it stood up on two legs and turned and looked at them. And he said it stood there for as long as he kept the headlights on it and just was staring at them. And so, and the whole family saw it. And so he, he reached under his, um, his seat and grabbed his pistol, his gun, and – he leaned out of the window, opened the door, and when he opened his door, the um, the cab light came on, and it dropped, and it took off. And he said it was a dog, no doubt about it. And he could not figure out how this dog was standing up on two legs looking at them. And <clears throat> he said um, – you know, and so – the whole family recounted the same story. That was just amazing to me. And um, he, you know, he described. I went out and did the height thing. It was like five or six feet tall. It wasn't overly large. Um, but he, um, I was sitting at their in their kitchen um, talking to them, and um, the little boy came in and said, he "said Yeah, it was just like the thing that was scratching at my window that night. Do you guys remember?" And then um, Randy was like, "Oh yeah, we forgot. He forgot totally about this." But he had these boys were twins and. The twins came screaming to their mom and dad one night, saying that there was a dog clawing at their window, at the screen on their on their on the house, um, and the window was open, but the, it was through the screen that they could see it. And um, Rand, he said he had totally forgotten about that; that it happened two like two years before they had seen this dog. And this this encounter with the dog only happened probably fourteen two thousand fourteen, I guess, was when I when I interviewed him. And um, it was uh, um, just to have the way that the whole interview went down. Then the boy came in and said, it was the same one that came to him. I remember our window, don't you remember? And then dad's reaction to that comment was, um, it, I was like, these guys really saw something. You know, it was just a little eight-year-old kid. I mean, he, had, you know, he wasn't smart enough to, at the time, say, see, that's what I was coming to my window. He came back later when I was there and, and mentioned it. And so um, it was. It was just a fascinating experience, and um, it wasn't a Sasquatch. That's what just gets me. He said. He said it was. It, it was just like basically the Beast of Seven Shoots, which is a photo that I've I've um, researched extensively. And so whenever I hear of bipedal, um, or whenever I hear of Sasquatches going on four legs, and people say they saw it run and stand up, I always wonder. Was it actually a Sasquatch? I kind of, you know, kind of wonder sometimes because I know in Louisiana, um, and I just talked to Jim Lansdale 
or a little earlier, they have a new show coming out called Killing Bigfoot. And um, Jim Lansdale was the one who really I cut my teeth on Bigfooting at Monster Central in North Louisiana. And um, they they always, I mean, Monster Central was a place where there were um, many different encounters. They actually um, shot one at Monster Central. I didn't kill it. But um, they would see him on four legs occasionally. And um, anyway, so that that to me was the one, the, really the one thing that stood out secondhand. And of course, I've had my own first experiences that stand out as well. But that was that was, to me was the most impressive kind of secondhand account I've ever heard. What about you, Melissa? Um, yeah, I, um, I had uh, an encounter. Uh, somebody that I that I witnessed um, the encounter. What, what really made the hair stand up on my neck about it is how close it was to where I currently live because it would not have been a place I would have thought um, would have, would have been a place they would be around simply because um, where, where the sighting occurred um, was on the very edge of the largest County in the entire state of Georgia. And, um, (laughs) but uh, it it, it was um, at the time, this was a 42 year old man. um, He was, going to one of these, um, because this is the largest county in Georgia, they have um, these really nice recreational areas all throughout the county um, that wind through the wilderness um, so that people can walk or run, um, and they have dirt bike trails off of them too, so that people can kind of, um, uh, or sorry, mountain bike trails, so that people can go, you know, bike um, cycling and, and feel like they're in the mountains riding their bikes and stuff. Um, and and the wa- there's a waterway, you know, that's just all in there. And uh, it's a really nice out-of-the-way park. And you, I mean, you feel like you're in the forest when you're in there, but you're walking on a paved road. Um, and so I, um, when I when I interviewed this um, guy, he, um, when I interviewed this guy, he uh, was telling me that he was on a on a morning walk and he had. Um, his phone in one ear and was listening to music in the other ear. He was on a conference call while he was on his walk. And he um, he decided when he was coming down to the bridge area, he wanted to hear the water. So he, he, took, the, he took the music out of his ear, um, out, of, out of, I guess, out of his right ear, and he's still having a phone call in the other ear. And I th- I th- actually, I think the phone call had just ended. That's what it was. And he was pulling his earbuds out and as he pulled the earbud out he turned his head and movement caught his eye and he saw um, about 50 yards from where he was standing um, maybe not even that far maybe like 30 yards from where he was standing he saw a big dark hairy leg and then a second dark hairy leg um, of something walking and then um, as he turned to look at it full on, he saw its rear end, and then it kind of ducked down and went through the, these bushes in that area. And so um, he just kind of stood there stunned, and he was like, did I really, what What was that? Did I really just, did I really just see that? And then this is a prominent businessman in the area. When he met me, he, it was, you know, it was kind of done. Um, he didn't want, he didn't want his name put out there. He didn't want anybody to know he was talking to me about this stuff. But he was more than happy to show me, you know, um, and, and and the other researcher I was with where this happened, and um, and so we went out there and took some measurements and such about where it happened. And the the interesting thing was, I went and stood exactly where he saw this creature duck and go into the brush. And the creature's hip came up to where my head, the top of my head is, and I'm 5'8". So that creature's, you know, butt cheek was 5'8 off the ground. (laughs) So that was a big creature, whatever it was. And he described it. He said it looked like a naked black man with really hairy legs. That's what it looked like to him. And so, um, and you could, again, I looked in his eyes. He was just, the disbelief on his face, he was just like, you know, I just, I, I, he's like, I'm so glad that I found you so that I could tell you about this because I can't talk to anybody about it because they'll all think I'm crazy. And, um, and so I did go back and we found impressions in the ground. They weren't really castable, but they were consistent. They were all about 15 and a half inches long or through that area. Um, you know, so something big had moved through that area and, um, it, like I said, it was on the outskirts on the very edge 
of the largest county in the state of Georgia, and um, the county that abuts up against that side is a little more rural, and there is a very large river that runs back through there, and there was a tributary of that river that where he was listening to the water that kind of runs through that area. It's very nice, very beautiful back there. Um, but, again, it's so close to urban development, I never would have guessed that um, – that the you know that a large creature would live back there. I have since learned, doing follow up research, that they have had a problem with bears in the area. That there are bears um, back on that side, um, on the on the on the county that's more rural. So um, again, going back to what we were talking about earlier about the vastness of places that are not yet developed, you know, back there. So there's a little bit, that, you know, obviously there's more room back there than I would have guessed. Um, although if you look at an aerial view, satellite map, satellite map of the area, it just it it doesn't seem. When you look at where a lot of big bigfoot reports come from around here, it doesn't look like the ideal spot that you would go researching. But I have been there a number of times um, at night and in the afternoon you know, just trying to see if, if I can find anything, any kind of sign. I've been researching that area now for probably hmm, probably four years. I haven't come back with anything conclusive um, other than that there's just a ton of coyote in the area and there's, um, you know, uh, that, that one report that just stands out <laughs> among others because it's been such an odd place. But, you know, this guy saw something. He's continued to follow um, follow my research um, since we met and, um you know, I think he does still uh, on occasion go um, in that park. Um, just, I want to say he was there early in the morning when it was just barely sunrise, so it was still kind of, it wasn't super, super light yet. I think when he goes to the park, he only goes during daylight hours. <laughs> but, um, but it really did, um, it, it shook him a bit, and that just stuck out in my mind um, because he was such a, like I said, a prominent businessman, this, this man living in the yuppiest part of the state, and um and that this happened just, you know, 20 minutes from where I live. It was just really um, kind of surreal, but um, but a very cool, very cool story and uh, a really, really interesting witness. So you guys, um, I'm always interested in how, what led people into to the crazy world of Bigfooting. Um, Rob, why don't you go first and tell us what, what your personal experience was before, you know, that led you to become uh, a researcher, um, if you use that phrase. <laughs> and, uh, sure. and, uh, yeah. <clears throat> well, I, um, <clears throat> so, you know, growing up, I didn't, I mean, I never, never gave it a second thought. I mean, honestly, it was something that was far and remote as far as I knew it was, um, if it was real, it was in the Pacific Northwest. And so, you know, that meant, not much to me. Well, in 2003, I was watching a show on the Travel Channel called Bigfootville. And <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, I think I, I just put it on. And if you've ever seen Bigfootville, it's about two police officers that had an encounter in um, southeast Oklahoma, Ada, Oklahoma. And it was a very believable show. Um, these These guys had their guns out. They brought a reporter out with them. While they're out there, something's throwing rocks, and it, the rocks are landing in the back of the truck. Um, and <clears throat> they actually the, – the cops pulled their weapons and were pointing it in the direction of whatever was throwing the rocks. And it was just a really believable show. Well, I looked up Ada, Oklahoma, and I lived in northwest Louisiana at the time in Shreveport, and it was only three hours away. And so I'm like, whoa, what the heck? And so it made sense that if Bigfoot's real, that it isn't just in the Pacific Northwest, that it could also be in, um, you know, in other parts of the country. So I started reading uh, reports. Um, I, of course, I went on to the BFRO website. Um, there's another group called the um, GCBRO, Gulf Coast Bigfoot Research Organization. I started looking for one near me, and of course, I found the GCBRO, and I became a member. And, um, of course, I did the online things. I was um, on the Bigfoot forums um, forever um, and participated in it quite extensively. And um, But um, I really kind of cut my teeth and on the, in the, with the GCBRO, and which <clears throat> the, one of the founders of it, Jim Lansdale, lived 45 minutes away. And so I was really glad to find him, and he had, he had a, their property that they would go to. Um, and so I started going out with them, and that was – 2003, and um, so here it is. What 13 years later, and I'm still 
still very very much involved in it and but that's really what got me interested was the show Bigfootville and um the realization that they weren't they were in a lot more places than um just in the Pacific Northwest. I was just excited to read reports in Louisiana and in Texas and Oklahoma and Mississippi and I just read everything I could get my hands on. Um probably like most people do when they first get involved is go out and kind of live vicariously through the people that had the encounters and just read them and, and, and experience, you know, kind of learn, learn for yourself through, through the reports. Very good. Melissa, how about you? What, what uh, brought you into the crazy world of big footing? My crazy dad. <laughs> um, my, um, my dad, I uh, always had had an interest in Bigfoot since I was a little girl. He had um, books about the unexplained that had the picture of, the, you know, the Patterson Gimlin picture of Patty. And, it, and um, he, whenever there was a program on TV about Bigfoot, you know, he'd always watch and I'd watch it with them. And um, so, you know, growing up, we, you know, Bigfoot was just a an interest for my dad. And he had songs that he would sing about Bigfoot. On, he'd, play, he'd play guitar and we'd sing with him. And he'd make up these songs about Bigfoot and we'd sing with him. So anyway, it was just a thing that my dad was into um, for me as a little girl. Um, it wasn't, I mean, I found it kind of interesting, but I didn't, um, I didn't really have a huge interest in it. Um, um, later um, in adulthood, <laughs> we lost my mom in um, 2004 and uh, to cancer, and then um, later that year, uh, my dad came to me and told me that his interest in Bigfoot um, was alive and well and had moved to the Internet now, <laughs> and I said, well, that's great, and he told me that there was this organization called the BFRO that um, that put on expeditions all over the country, and they taught you how to look for Bigfoot, and I said, well, that's great, Dad. You should go. <laughs> that sounds right up your alley. You should totally do that. And um, I could tell he didn't kind of want to go by himself, probably because he was afraid of what kind of weirdos he'd run in on these expeditions or whatever. So I said, you know, if you really want to go, I'll I'll go with you. Um, so uh, he's like, okay. So he uh, he took me, and he actually took my brother also, which was a huge mistake. My brother's like this huge skeptic, but he took us both um, with, with us on this um, on this BFRO expedition. And we met Matt Moneymaker and. Um, and we just and we met some of the nicest people I've ever met in my life, and we had such a good time. It was so fun, and so um, we ended up ditching my brother and going on the next expedition a few weeks later. That was just up just a little bit north of in Tennessee, <laughs> and we had so much fun. And um, so we just kind of got got the bug and got hooked on it right away. Um, it was just really really fun. And um, as I went on expedition after expedition, I became a, a researcher for that organization and helped to put on expeditions and um, interviewed a lot of witnesses and, and did a lot of reports and such. And, and then later I joined, you know, other um, organizations and went on other expeditions in different, part, different parts of the country. And um, and that's when I um, ended up meeting Rob. And um, and I guess the rest is history. So that's how I got into it. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so now you guys have been researching for a while and been out a lot. Rob, what what has been your most compelling experience? And have you had what I refer to as the confirmation encounter? Yeah, I, I have seen one. Um, in Oklahoma, um, in 2009, I was with Maverick, Mid-America Bigfoot Research Center, which is a group I moved to from the GCBRO. <clears throat> um me and five other people were walking down a road. It was 10 p.m. We weren't really, we weren't really at the time researching per se. We had just stepped away from the campfire and we're just chatting. <clears throat> and we had a few flashlights, and I had my parabolic mic with me, um, but I didn't have it on. Well, at the end of this road is a, it's a gravel road. At the end of the road is a highway, and um, just across this, it was in the mountains. Just across this um, highway. Um, we all saw it at the same time. Um, these gigantic eyes, they were green, reflected back in the he- in our lights, in our headlamps. And you could see the outline of this head behind it that was enormous. It was in the skyline behind it that we could see this head. And <clears throat> we saw it for, I saw it for two seconds. 
I saw one eye. I, I saw two eyes, and then I saw one eye, and then I saw no eyes, and it was gone. And <clears throat> it was standing behind a set of reeds. It was this was January, and the reeds were everything was dead, and these reeds were kind of were pale. Well, my light reflected back off of back off these reeds really brightly, and then these eyes were behind these reeds, and we went up. And so I, I, here's what happened. I threw on my. I mean, you're when you see this and you're like, what did I just see? And you throw. I threw on my parabolic mic, and I'm listening. I'm on. Okay, I got. I, it was gone. It was no. We couldn't see anything else. It was there was a fence there too, a barbed wire fence, so we couldn't just chase it. So I threw, and you, I don't know, I didn't feel like chasing it honestly. I, I went into what I call fight or flight mode. My body like physically changed. And I think people say they get zapped, but I think it's just a natural reaction to seeing or encountering something that maybe shouldn't be there. And so, but my body physically changed, and my heart started racing. I was sweating. Um, you know. It was it was a weird experience. I threw on my parabolic mic and was listening. I listened for a few seconds and I couldn't hear anything. And I reach up, <clears throat> and the headset was on facing outwards. I had thrown it on so quickly, the 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 speakers were facing away from my ear. So, you know, it it was one of those things that, um, for me, we went we went back the next morning and looked for evidence in the daylight, and we measured these reeds. There was nothing behind them. It was just you know, some reeds. It was really thin. It was, you know, maybe a, a three foot um, deep section of reeds in a field. And the reeds were eight feet tall. And these eyes were above the reeds. It was, it was, it was fascinating. And it, to me, it was conclusive evidence that I saw a Sasquatch. <clears throat> I didn't see the face, didn't see the hairy arms. I saw enough in my mind that this is conclusive for me. Um, I've had other things happen. I mean, I've, I've had tree knocks. I actually had a tree knock in 2014 in July in Oklahoma, um, about 15 feet from my tent at 3 a.m. Um, and it was just so solid that there is no other explanation. And it was like, right. We were in a campground. It was just right. Whatever this was, was in the campground as well and knocked on a tree. And we actually went back, um, and did a research trip there a couple of times after that and had some, some interesting things happen as well. But yeah, I've seen one I've, and I've heard, I've heard enough that it's, these are conclusively, they conclusively exist in my mind. Yeah. One of the, you brought up an interesting point with the zapping, you know, I'm personally, I, I spend uh, a lot of time in the woods uh, all around Oregon and Washington. And uh, I just, I, I've never experienced it. I don't roll it out that uh, something, if not Sasquatch, is possibly capable of doing this. We know we have other animals that obviously can have, have this infrasound capability, this zapping power. Um, but to me, it's amazing. You know, I had an encounter back in 2011 and a sighting, and, uh, you know, early morning hours. We're talking about 2 o'clock in the morning. And I remember being in my tent, and I had two buddies with me, and I remember feeling almost, because uh, it was just crazy what was going on. It was nuts. It was just uh, nothing I've ever experienced before. And I remember yeah. feeling par- paralyzed, you know, uh, and I'll, I'll be honest, I was scared. Yeah. I was, well, what, what is yeah. what is this thing going to do? I don't, yep. I didn't see it at the time, at that particular time, uh, but I was going, what is this thing going to do? It's, it, whatever is out there is massive and strong and it's, it's, th- you know, it threw a rock and it's beating a tree and it's just stomping around. And I was freaked out. And so I, 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 I kind of became paralyzed with fear. And then I said, okay, I walked myself out of it. You know, I mean, I was chit chatting with a buddy, you know, whispering back and forth from tent to tent. And I walked myself out of it and I got the courage to peek out my tent. But uh, people react differently in times of extreme stress and fear, especially if you're encountering something of unknown, uh, you know, that you've never experienced before, this situation you've never experienced before. You're going you're gonna to be, you know, for some, you know, I'm not a, some sort of badass, but, you know, for some, you know, you're going to experience this, this tension. This Your mind's going to work differently. Everybody yeah. is different in, in, in these situations. So, I think a lot yeah. of people were like, well, maybe I experienced zapping, when in fact it's just 
pure adrenaline and fear, you know? I mean, do you yeah, agree? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, I say that, and then I know I spent a month in Paris last summer, all right, and the French are crazy. I was actually taking a picture of the fights, and a Frenchman walked up to me and threatened to throw my camera in the river because I was taking a picture of, of course, the building behind him, but he happened to be in the frame. <clears throat> and here's this – he's drunk. <laughs> here's this drunk Frenchman <laughs> standing on a bridge going <laughs> over the Seine River. I mean, I'm taking a picture of, like, Notre Dame, you know, one of the most probably photographed landmarks in the world. And here, this, this drunk Frenchman is starting to throw my camera in the river, and he's in my face. <laughs> and – my, I, I, I was to me. I was really surprised at how calm I was. Like I, my my heart rate never went up. I didn't. I didn't have that fight or flight feeling that I had when I saw this thing. You know. So maybe it's maybe there's different variations of the intensity that you may have. But um, or maybe maybe he just maybe Bigfoot wasn't drunk enough to cause it. <laughs> I don't know. But. Uh, I can still I, I can still see the drunk Frenchman's red eyes looking at me, yeah. you know, threatening to throw my camera in the river. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I don't know. It's, it's... <laughs> yeah. Who would have found out if that drunk Frenchman can swim if he would have thrown my camera yeah. in the river? <laughs> if he'd have been in there after it. So Melissa, ha- what what is what has been your most interesting personal experience and have you had that confirmation encounter? No, I have not had that perfect confirmation <laughs> just, just yet. I'm I'm keep I keep looking and waiting for it to come but um not yet. But I have had multiple experiences where I know in my heart of hearts it was Sasquatch related. Um and and I'll share one of those that uh, I've had I've I've had several but this is one that I like to tell um because it was with my dad and he's the one that got me into it um I I was on an expedition in North Carolina and my dad was with me and we were with about I don't know 15 other people and there was um a, it was very 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 cold it was probably in the teens and um we were um we decided to go across the street from the campground up this gravel road to where this pre-Civil War cemetery was. Um, the walk from the campground was m- maybe a quarter mile. wasn't that far. And um, so we were all decked out in, like, hunter jumpsuits, you know, the kind that you put your arms and legs in and zip up and you have the big cone hat on. We were all wearing those because it was so cold. And um, we, uh, I guess there was about six of us that decided to to leave the campfire and go down this road and hang out in the cemetery for a little while. And um, I I was on point. I was the first person to go down the road, and then my dad was kind of behind me a few paces, and then the rest of the guys were behind my dad, and they had they all had night vision. Nobody had thermals. Thermals weren't like a regular thing yet. <laughs> so um, we all you know a handful of these guys had um, had night vision, so they were all kind of bringing up the rear scanning as we were walking up. And um, by this point, I had been squashing for a while and, you know, taking point going down a a dark trail did not freak me out. Um, I I was pretty comfortable with it. And I was only, I don't know, a few paces in front of my dad. And um, I just remember getting really, really, going back to the zapping thing, (laughs) I just remember getting really, really, really uncomfortable. My heart started to race. I started to sweat. I just kind of felt really, really uncomfortable, kind of scared, but I, you know, I didn't really know why. And I thought, oh, you're just freaking yourself out. You're freaking yourself out. I'm not about to tell these people. And um, so, <laughs> so I just kind of talked myself out of it. And, um, and so I just kept walking until I led the group to the cemetery. Um, and so we kind of spread out in the cemetery. And some people kind of, there was like a little pavilion on one side, but the boards were all dilapidated, so you couldn't really get inside of it. And, um, you could only like stand on the edges. So some of the guys were kind of perched on the edges, scanning the wood line with, with their um, night vision. My dad and I were just kind of sitting on the ground, kind of in the middle, just hanging out there. And then there were some other guys that were off on the other, uh, on the other side of the cemetery. Um, one of them had had a night vision scope also. So we were just we hung out there for a while. 
Um, we did some calls. I think we did some wood knocks. We just, you know, we just, just did the regular squats and things, but mostly we just kind of sat and listened. Um, it was getting, like I said, it was really, really cold, and we'd been away from the fire for probably a good hour at this point, and my dad was like, I'm getting really cold. <laughs> I'm like, okay, and, and so we did, and then he said, I have to go to the bathroom. So I'm like, all right, well, let's just go. And so I decided I'd walk my dad back to camp, but the guys with the night vision wanted to stay there. And I said, okay, so I'll just walk my dad back. And so I walked with my dad back. I kind of led him out of the cemetery back to the gravel road, and he was behind me, um, and then, you know, I – I heard him walking behind me and then it, it, he kind of stopped at one point and I turned and behind me and looked and he was further behind me than I realized. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, Oh, I thought somebody was coming to join us. And I said, no, it's just you and me. Nobody else wanted to, to go. And, um, and he said, okay. And so he walked and we, by that point he caught up to me and we we're walking shoulder to shoulder. Um, and we walked, you know, all the way down the road back into the camp. Well, um, a little while later, the other guys came back to camp, but I was way off um, somewhere else in the camp talking to some other people we were camping with, and they had to track me down and find me, and they came back, and they were all excited and all animated, and they said, Melissa, show us the trail that you walked down on um, when you left your dad to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? And they said, where's that trail? We're trying to find that trail that you walked through. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. And they said, at some point, you must have separated from your dad and walked through the woods. Where does that trail come out? And I just said, you guys, I've walked up and down that road a hundred times. There's no trail off of it. And I said, my, and I never left my dad's side. We walked shoulder to shoulder all the way down. And then we all kind of had that realization come over us at the same time. And they're like, everybody get your cameras. We're going back up there. We're going to reenact this thing. So we did. We all went back up there. And we we walked out. Everybody had their um, their their night vision. The same guy that that was really questioning me about the trail, he zoned in and watched me and my dad walk out of the cemetery and walk again. And he said, whatever you know, we reenacted exactly how we'd left and everything. And he said, whatever it was um, that that I saw wasn't you guys. It was something different, was completely different than you guys did through the thing. Um, and it, and what it was doing was trailing you. Um, you know, through the woods. It was kind of paralleling you through the woods as you walked down the road. And so um, that would explain, you know, I think why I felt uncomfortable on the way in and then why my dad thought something was behind us on the way out. So um, that was kind of one of those things that after it was over, you're like, oh, my gosh, something was there. So um, cool story. No, that's yeah. a great story. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's a really good story. Roasted, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, guys, you've done a lot of work with, uh, you know, a lot of the big names in the field. You know, I mean, you guys have been working with, you guys have done some work with Meldrum. Can you elaborate on that, too, a little bit? Uh, some of the, you know, you're spending time with him. I mean, I, I've been out on the field with Meldrum uh, quite a few times, as Gunner has as well. Yeah, engrossing individual, very intelligent guy. Um, what were you guys doing out there uh, working with with uh, Mr. Meldrum? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to tell him, Rob? Um, want me to tell him? Well, so <clears throat> one of the one of the cool things that we have, and a lot of people have these, but we I have collected um, a huge trove of old newspaper articles referencing um, Bigfoot. Um, dogmen, um, wild Lake men, Burnson. just a, a huge, a huge number of these articles, and um, and talking to Dr. Meldrum, we thought it would be a cool project to take this idea of researching these articles and maybe see if we can get some interest from some of the networks out there in this particular um, on this topic. And I actually was able to get Dr. Meldrum to um, be in a film that I co-wrote and um, co-produced, um, and it's still in post-production. Hopefully, it gets done soon. <laughs> Called Skookum. Um, Dr. Meldrum is actually an actor in it and does a great job. 
Um, and that's kind of how we first started. That's how we really first, that's really the first time I met Dr. Meldrum. Um, and uh, so it was a natural thing for us to um, talk about other media type projects. It's just one of the things that I do. I'm, I've always been a kind of a creative person in the college that I did complete. I was in broadcasting and communications. And so um, those, um, those have always interest, interested me. And this idea of digging into these articles um, and sharing the cool stories behind them on television is um, was the basically the project that we have worked with Dr. Meldrum on, and so um, we've been um, on two two trips with him that were specifically set up to capture footage of us doing the research on these articles, and we're we're going to talk. We actually have a production company um, with us on that project. Um, it's called White Wolf Entertainment. Um, the guy that did Monster Quest series is working with us on it. Um, and it's a, it's a lot of work, a lot of uh, trial and error to get the and networks interested in it, but we think it would be a great concept um, for television. So that's the, that is really the big project that we've worked on with Dr. Meldrum. But um, we've... Um, where where we do it from a scientific perspective is that we want to go in and get to the bottom of these articles, and we've just uncovered some really fascinating um, things about them that um, uh, is is relevant to science and rele relevant to the scientific community in a much greater way than even to the cryptid world, um, to really history in general. And so... Um, that's, I mean, that's, and from a scientific perspective, Dr. Meldrum really appreciates that, you know. Mm -hmm. It's it's difficult. Yeah. It really is difficult to do science in this field because you're really going on conjecture, as he, the word he loves to use, conjecture, and, and, you know, old wives' tales a lot of times. And when you can have something as solid as a newspaper article, um, <clears throat> it's it's something you put your hands on, you know. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, so, I, I got to ask you this, and this is, you know, I want to I want to talk a little bit about Dogman a little bit and get into uh, some of your work with the Beast of Seven Shoots, Rob. But uh, I'm going to ask both of you guys this, you know, in your opinion, uh, difficult question, but in your opinion, uh, between the both of you, and you guys probably possibly differ or may not have a, a huge opinion on this, but what is Sasquatch? Um, well, I think in my opinion, it's, you know, we've always heard the term the missing link. Um, for me, it's a necessary biological being, not anything other than biological being, that um, it, it must exist. It, you know, if you believe in evolution, um, <clears throat> there are different um, uh branches of intelligence out there and there has to be something between like I said before a bear and a human and so from a layman's perspective that's the best way that I can put where what I think it is I mean everything outside of that is is going to be outside of anything I've really put too much thought in um, just because there's so many people working on it you just can't be expert at everything but that's kind of my that's my gut feeling is that it's um, something off the evolutionary chain that was smart enough to survive um, the conquest of evolution and um, and also man, which man is probably going to be its greatest predator, and being able to avoid man has been its greatest um, achievement. And Melissa, your thoughts? Um, I pretty much in line with Rob. Um, I think that it's um, somewhere between uh, ape and man, just a, an evolutionary um, anomaly, maybe, or just I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what happened, but I think it, it's just something that's developed. I, I, I know people vary on the Gigantopithecus theory, but I, I, I can kind of see how that might be um, that mm -hmm. that it that it kind of developed from that. 
Um, and then, you know, the different colors and sizes that we see, just all different evolutionary um, differences that have occurred based on the geographic regions and, and, and everything that's there. I mean, it, that makes sense to me. That's acceptable to me. Yeah. I, 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 I can buy into that. Um, but I don't, I don't, I don't um, believe that it um, has, exceptional, has exceptional mystical powers um, or um, uh, is um, an alien or anything like that. I, I just believe it's a flesh and blood creature that has maybe extra sensory abilities that allow it to remain elusive and uh, an extraordinary ability to hide in plain sight um, maybe to manipulate the visual field somewhat just to in their favor to keep you know to keep themselves elusive so um you, you know i I think everything that they're reported to do from infrasound to the red eyes I mean, all these things can be explained um, scientifically so i don't um you know I don't think that there's anything too um too fantastic about what they can do I think they're just um they're just uh, flesh and blood blood creatures, um, somewhere between ape and man, highly intelligent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and that's kind of where I stand, and I believe I could speak for Gunner as, as to our experiences and and where we're at now. Is we can be in we're in the same boat here. Now, uh, you have you have this subject Sasquatch, and we got your kind of opinion as to possibly. Sasquatch may or may not be, um, and and I think uh, you both, as individuals, uh, Rob, you know, definitely in the boat that that Sasquatch exists, it's out there, and Melissa, I think you're 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 very open to it, but not, you know, maybe not um, fully aboard that it may or may not exist, but you have. I- yeah, I, be- I believe it exists. I just want the conclusive proof. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You want you want that sighting. You want yeah, yeah. I get it. <laughs> here, here. I'm with yeah, Melissa here, here. there. <laughs> but you know, um, there there are a lot of reports around the country, Rob, uh, that don't fit into the Sasquatch realm. That that's kind of uh, you know these reports that were you get. Well, I mean, I'd say around the country, but I, I would have to say. Uh, Pacific Northwest doesn't have a whole lot of those. It's mostly, you know, east of the Pacific Northwest. But you get these reports where uh, people report um, a muzzle or um, different type of behavior, and uh, so you know, on on what people may think is a Sasquatch or not. Those kind of interest me because, um, you know, there there are many reports out there. You know. Th- uh, Mike Richburg, a uh, fellow co-host and who hosts the uh, show Animal Extent on our network here, uh, talks about the hide behind. And the hide behind is very – it's an older um, cryptid uh, the Indians, you know, the Native Americans reported about um, that seemed to have a muzzle, uh, you know, and whatnot. De- very much different than the Sasquatch, even though some of the characteristics are the same. But very much different, and the reports, you know, east of the Pacific Northwest, quite a few of them um, report this muzzle, this different behavior, um, size, hair, you name it, and it, it stands out to me as something different than SAS. And I know that I've talked to you before, Rob, about uh, the photo that you obtained uh, and whatnot of the Beast of Seven Shoots, which is an interesting photo um, out of, I believe, Ontario. Uh, Canada, and uh, could you talk a little bit about that and your ideas, I mean, as to are we dealing with uh, another, a whole separate type of cryptid? You with uh, you with me, Rob? Hello? Hello? <laughs> it looks like somehow Rob got... Here, let's let Rob back in. It looks like somehow he got shut out. Yeah. Uh, hey, Rob. Here. Welcome back to Monster X Radio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I dropped off. I've been listening though. I, it, okay. My call dropped. I'm back. Um, yeah. No, the the, um, the Beast of Seven Shoots um, photo um, is is definitely Quebec. I mean, it's it's the Parc de Sept Shoots. Um, that photo, there was a um, a cropped out little tiny version of it that was posted on the Bigfoot forums in 2005. And um, it was interestingly interesting enough that I contacted the guy who, um, 
you know, had, had ownership of the photo and had taken the photo and said, there, you know, this is interesting. Could I, you know, could I see the larger photo? And he said, sure, I'll, I'll mail you a copy. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I was like, well, can you email me a copy? <laughs> and so he's like, oh, yeah, okay, I guess I can do that. And um, so um, he's a Frenchman named Larry. And, um, you know, he sent me the full he, – what he sent me was a, wasn't what I expected, but it was a full, full-sized full photo of a – and you've all seen the photo, um, the full-sized one. And, um, you know, I, I said, would you mind chatting with me about it? And so he said, yes, yeah, sure. So I talked to him for a while, and um, he ended up sending me all of the photos that he had taken that day. And this one fit right in line with all of the others. Um and he also had actually taken video as well that day, and so I have I have all the photos and videos, and so I know the exact location, um, and <clears throat> that um, that photo to me kind of for a couple of weeks I really wasn't sure what I was looking at, um, and uh, I was actually sitting at, at Monster Central with Jim, with Jim Lansdale, um, and Jim's kind of the one who pointed out what it was holding. I, it took me a while to really get my head around what it could, what it could have been holding. And um, he's the one who said, well, it, it's holding a dog. And this photo to me is the most compelling photo of a cryptid ever taken. I just can't find anything more compelling as a photograph. And I, I say that because I'm biased, obviously. I, I did all the research on it. Um, and I was unable to find any holes in this in this guy's story. He was a construction a, con- a construction um, driver. He drove a dump truck for a living. He really didn't have the resources to hoax. Um, and of course, we did follow up follow up work on it. And I I kind of what what cued me in that this could be something else. I had never considered there being anything else until I Googled the term snouted Bigfoot. Hang on a second. What? Yeah. Okay. Um, until I Googled the term snouted Bigfoot. And um, I, lo and behold, I found all of these reports in the same general vicinity in the northeast around the Great Lakes um, of of people seeing something where, that they described as a snouted creature or a dog man. And, um, of course, the beast of um, – uh, LBL and uh, Beast of Bray Road are two of those type of creatures. <clears throat> it, they would also describe it as having an aggressive stare, which this thing is doing. Um, a lot of the drawings that eyewitnesses had had it holding some type of animal or roadkill, which this thing was doing. Um, they would describe it as having a triangular-shaped head. <clears throat> as a as a web person, I use Photoshop. I've used Photoshop since the program was created practically. So I cracked open Photoshop and did a really close analysis on the uh, the area where the eyes are out of this photograph. And you can use a tool called Unsharpened Mask that increases the contrast between the lights and the darks. And I was able to pull out the eyes. And you can clearly see the eyes in the work that I've done. And they're slanted in the same way that people describe, describe them. And so this thing was being described by other people in other places, and I was just amazed at that. That was what made me say, this is the real deal. There's something in this photograph. And, of course, I did the same thing with the dog, the thing that it's holding, and using unsharpened mask and increased the contrast between the lights and the darks, the grays. And you can see the dog's eyes, and you can see its ears. And um, that, to me, was just amazing. And, um, you know, there's so many – um, reports out there that match this. Of course, I'm in South Louisiana, and you have the Lugaru, which is um, basically werewolf. Um, you have the Beast of Gouvedon out of France, um, and so there's a, there's a history of people seeing these things, and it's it's such on the fringe of science and fringe of reality that nobody really, I mean can believe it until they get in. It's just like Bigfoot, get in and do your homework, and there's evidence there to support it. And so that's that's um, that's where I stand on it, you know. And, I, again, I've done the work. I, it's not this isn't speculation. I've, I've spent a good deal of time looking into these things, and they're real. Um, yeah. This what, photo what stands out to me, in that, to me that, is the that, most compelling photo out there. Right. What stands out to me in that photo is, well, first of all, it's not been debunked. No one's come out and said it's a hoax. No one's proven it otherwise. That sounds out yeah. to me. And, and well, see, I did the work on it to keep them from being yeah. able to do that. I mean, I had this guy go back out 
and people were saying, oh, it's a stump. Well, we went back out, and he I have video of him standing in that location. It's not a stump. And his girlfriend stood up there and took pictures of him standing down in, in that area, you know, where the thing was. And it's clearly not a stump. There's something standing there. Yeah. And and then you see this, I mean, the features, uh, when I'm looking at the picture, and this is just my myself looking at the picture, it, it looks like it's got this sort of, it looks to me almost like baboonish. Uh, yeah, it's holding something. It looks like a, a white poodle or a white dog, and oh. uh, it's very yeah. interesting, you know. But it's not been proven to be a hoax. I mean, I'm very open to the idea that that uh, it's something else. But I, I've not seen any evidence uh, put forthright that it is a hoax. And you've done the legwork on this and whatnot. And I mean, it, it, there's a picture of something there. It looks like it's holding. Uh, something like a little dog or something and but it looks very baboonish to me uh in the picture you know I, that's all i really I mean, of course i'm only going off the picture uh what it is i have no yeah, idea I've put, but i've put this no and i've i've done the re, i took this photo yeah. and i've you know I've got the head and grabbed the baboon head and put them side by side when you put them side by side they look nothing alike there's there okay. isn't any animal out there that this thing matches there really isn't no look come here my dog's in the yard come here baby yeah so there isn't any animal out there that this thing matches. What it does match is the eyewitness descriptions. That is what is just so amazing, that it matches the eyewitness descriptions of people in Michigan and in Minnesota, um, in Wisconsin, um, you know, in Louisiana. The aggressive nature, um, the, the holding roadkill, the triangular-shaped head, um, the, white, the white head, the um, the slanted eyes, the even somebody said the arm bent forward at the elbow. And this is somebody describing the Beast of Bray Road, you know. Mm-hmm. And if you look at that photo, the arm is bent forward at the elbow. It's like, it's almost like if it's a hoax, this guy took those descriptions and positioned this thing in this location and took a photo of it. Right. What about Based a height? On I mean, those you got descriptions. You guys did did a little bit of a recreation. So, were you given? Uh, I mean, having someone stand down there, how did this thing compare in girth and height? It was not much bigger. Um, mm-hmm. I had the photographer, the guy who took the photo, go back and do this for me. About a month later, I guess, is when he went. Um, after he had taken the original photo, he went back, and <clears throat> you can see the foliage has grown in a little bit, but it's the same year. It's the um, it's just a month later, and what I had him do was line up his camera with the knots on the tree that are in the foreground, so that he got the camera in the exact same place, pretty much, with um, the way that the original photo was taken. And then I think he actually had his girlfriend stand down there and take it. Um, and I've had other since that I had a website up, and again that. I lost a server. I had a server, a hosting company that crashed a server for me, and I haven't taken the time to put everything back up. But I had a website dedicated to this, and um, hmm. so he had his girlfriend do this and and um, go stand down there. And but I, when I had the website up, people would send me emails, and I have probably six or seven stories that people sent me um, saying I saw, I, the name of this. The website was Have You Seen This Creature dot com, and because that's what I want. I wanted to find people who had seen something similar. And so um, that's – I had people send me emails um, from somebody from California, um, people too from the same kind of general area. Um, and the descriptions that they gave were, yeah, that's the, the same thing I saw. And so to me it goes just back to the um, – just the history, of, the history of sightings is what is just so compelling and interesting to me. And the mm-hmm. similar description to this. And the, the history, I mean, the Beast of Gouvedon, um, to me, is a historic tale that is, it's a, it's a fact that it happened. Um, the king actually sent, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Beast of Gouvedon, but it was a, supposedly a werewolf in seventeen late 1700s that um, killed dozens of people, um, children, women and children in a village um, over many years. And the king actually France, sent out missionaries. In France, yep, and sent out merc- yeah. king, the king of France mercenaries out to try to kill it, and Ken Gearhart and um, did a show on it um, a few years back. And um, there's a movie um, 
based on it as well, called uh, The Pack de Lou, which is The Brotherhood of the Wolf. It's a great film. It's done in the 90s, but it's just a fantastic film. Um, and uh, the way the film ends, it's you think the creature's dead. Um, it was actually, you know, uh, it's a fictional account of that episode um, to, for film, but you think it's dead, but in the end, they're sailing it to America, which was just a really fascinating um a fascinating way to end the film, you know? Um, yeah. So selling it to the new world and yeah. um, it ends on that note. And, right. Uh, the photo to me it, uh, has stood the test of time, whereas no one's come out and said, oh, yeah, that's a hoax. I mean, well, people claim it's a hoax or whatever, but, I mean, there's been no uh, really substantial evidence that it is a hoax. It stood the test yeah. of time much the same as the Patty film. Um, uh, yep. This photo is very intriguing to me. I won't claim that it's real. I won't claim that it's not real. Uh, I wasn't there, and it's, it's a photo. There's really, you know, uh, all I've got to go on is the photo and your work behind it and whatnot. But it's very yeah. freaking intriguing and very odd. Well, you got different, sh- you know, you got different colors on this thing that's standing there. It's not just like one solid color. You got different shades yeah. of color on it, and it seems to be yeah, holding right. something. And to me, that's that's pretty fascinating. It is. Um, you know, you have the red on the head, and it's holding what I surmised to be lunch, and it was probably eating that dog. Um, I actually had some people email me um, from that area and say that there's a koi dog problem out there near the Park the park Decept Shoots because people go out, and that's where they release unwanted pets. And the, the, um, pro- the province actually built a pound um, not far from here to to deal with the koi dog problem and to deal with all these unwanted pets that were being dropped out dropped off in this area. So that was kind of a fascinating bit of um, information that somebody um, had emailed me about this area that was that was actually from that area. Um, but as far as people debunking it, it it's undebunkable, it's unprovable. But I did everything I could to debunk it right out of the gate, and I documented everything I did. Um, very, very thoroughly, and I put everything out there. I mean, I had hundreds of photos, um, the original photos, everything he sent me originally, um, I still have, and I can put out again. I will eventually. <laughs> and yeah. um, then all of the follow-up work that we did, that I did as well, that I had him go out and do. Um, you know, there's so many – I mean, look, if, if he had taken one photo and I'd gone back and Photoshopped this thing in, well, there would be one photo. But he, there was a whole line of photos. There was, you know, he, he the story jived up. He was out. He had a new camera. He was out at this pretty park one day. I was taking pictures, and he had the whole set. Um, so, you know, there's um, always a chance that it's a hoax. But, you know, I've yeah. I've done as much as I can to prove that it's a hoax, and I haven't been able to to prove, to prove that he did anything that would. There's no red flags, you know. Right. No one. Come here. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, I mean, can you elaborate a little bit uh, of the backstory? I mean, what were these guys doing out there hiking and just were taking photos? And they, I mean, did they see this thing and took a photo of it, or I mean, how did that work out? No, it was one guy. Um, he w- he was on his day off, and he had a, a new camera. It was a Sony PowerShot, and he was just off. He was just enjoying his day. Um, he went out to this park. It's called Park. The Sep Shoots, which stands for Park of Seven Waterfalls, and they have these long um, bridges that cross the ravines where these waterfalls are, so you get a like a pristine view of them from from these bridges when you're standing on it. And he was taking pictures on, you know, of all of the waterfalls from these different bridges he was on. And <clears throat> he was back at his house that evening or maybe the next day. I don't remember exactly when going through the photos and looking at him, and he notices this thing standing down in the bottom right corner of this photo. Um, he, he really, if you look at the photos, this is one of the more beautiful photos he took. And so to me, I'm thinking, okay, if it, when I look at my own photos, I kind of pick out my favorites. If I have a hundred and I had 175 photos, I think um, I pick out the favorites and I use those. Well, this would have been one of my favorites and I'm looking at it. And then I look down the corner and I see this thing standing down and it looking up at me. So, it was he he saw it after the fact. It wasn't something where he I mean, obviously I would think if he would have seen it at the moment, he would have taken a whole bunch of photos of it, you know. Nolan, come here. 
So he um, he noticed this when he was back sitting at his computer looking at his photos. And I've been through his videos as well, and mm -hmm. none of the videos were of that specific area. I was really hoping because he said, oh, I have photos and videos I took. So I, he sent them all to me, um, and I looked at the videos. Of course, none of them were from that exact area, so there wasn't any chance that he captured it on video. Um, but, um, you know, again, I, I just go back to this photo matches so many descriptions that people have had of um, – this this very creature and um it was uh it was really interesting one of the one of the stories and you can look this up um if you don't remember it a guy named Stephen Kruger um from Wisconsin Elkhorn Wisconsin was uh he worked for the parish I don't remember exactly which parish it was I mean for the county he worked for the county as a roadkill remover he basically would go pick up dead deer on the side of the road well one night he was he had just loaded a deer in the back of his truck and he's sitting in filling out an incident report, and he said he felt his truck shake. And he looks in his um, the rearview mirror, and he sees something standing in the back of his truck that he describes as a bear man or a man or a you know something on two legs with a snout basically. And um, <clears throat> this can't you know he said he drove off <clears throat> and it it hauled the deer off and. He, out of the truck and he drove off and left his gate behind and um which meant he had to come back for it and he wasn't too happy about it apparently um but it really freaked him out he actually reported it to the sheriff the sheriff's department um and uh so reports came out and i think matt moneymaker kind of started this saying that you know stephen Kruger they, they filed it as a bigfoot report and he goes on record saying it was not a bigfoot it was something with a snout it was like a bear man is how he described it um and so it, it, that's a really good that's one of the better better stories out there better reports out there that where people are mistaking sasquatches for or mistaking these things for sasquatches i think that was about 2008 and it was it was a big story i mean it was it was a national news story mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that, uh, well, I mean, w given the amount of reports, you know, I don't, here in the Pacific Northwest, I really don't get a whole lot of reports of this nature. Uh, they're mm -hmm. very much so Sasquatch-related and, and pretty stereotypical of uh, what uh, most describe Sasquatch to be. But yeah. um, I do pay attention around the country to the stories, and uh, that, that photo that, uh, you know, you obtained of the b seven shoots, well, you know, I've talked to Linda Godfrey. I'm sure you've had collaboration with her as well, you know, uh, with yeah. the dogman matter. It seems like there's something else going on. I don't know. It's not it, – I'll be, I'll be honest with you, it's not really my thing. But it's, yeah. it's interesting because uh, a lot of people just, you know, like the Sasquatch and Bigfoot encounters, yeah. to describe the same thing with this dogman, bearman, whatever you want to call it, the same sort of uh, signatures apply there with their encounters. Yeah, no, and I, I have. I've talked to Linda. She um, she kind of dismisses this photo without without really looking at it, which is her right to do. Um, right. So she, I don't think she, she thinks there's much to it, which is fine. Like I said, it's her right. Um, but um, you know, mm -hmm. I just look yeah. at the evidence, yeah. and to me, this photo is just you know, it's it's not a it's not a it's not there's no paradoia going on. There's something there. You know, there's definitely something there. It's not photoshopped. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm confident of that, and I'm I'm as I'm considered a Photoshop expert, I guess, maybe in my own <laughs> mind. Um, but um, look, I mean, I've done as much as much research on this as I could to debunk it, and I couldn't. And I'm all I'm all about the facts. I mean, I'm I mean, this is a whole other conversation, but I have to right. think Patterson Gimlin hoax, you know. So um, yeah, right. Yeah, I have to think you know, the photo is real. So I'm. Um, you know, I'm not. It's not like I'm trying to keep the mainstream happy. I'll, I'll, I'll go with where my own instinct and research tells me. I, I seldom follow the crowd. Yeah, what, what you brought up an interesting point. I'm going to bring this up right now because I think it's kind of it's funny, but yet uh, interesting. Uh, you know, you and Melissa work together a lot and uh, are out in the field a lot and do your thing. But Melissa believes the Patterson film, the, the Patterson Gimlin film, to be real, whereas you do not. Uh, do you guys have other 
well, we'll talk a little bit about that, but do you guys have other disagreements <laughs> besides this this uh, film? Oh, where are you? Melissa not going to disagree with me. Ah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, this whole werewolf thing, what is that all about? I, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, um, I, I think in 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 matters of cryptids, um, that's really the only argument that we have is the Patterson Gim, Gimlin film, um, and he still tries to sway me to his side, but it it just hasn't worked yet because I've had an in depth interview with Dr. Meldrum over it, and Dr. Meldrum is the is the foot expert, <laughs> the gait expert. <laughs> The motion expert, and he he, he agrees that there's she's real. There's a flap. I'm telling you, there's a flap. There's not a flap. It's in your imagination. It's just yeah, not there. You know what? I first saw the flap. I was actually, again, sitting at Monster Central with M.K. Davis, and he, I was sitting on the tailgate with him looking at his laptop um, with the work he had done. This was years ago. On the, it was kind of his first work on the patterson Gimlin. And, um, I mean, again, you know, I thought, okay, Patterson, Gimlin, cool. Uh, it's real. Okay, I, you know, whatever. And <clears throat> I'm sitting there watching this thing walk, and I see a flap. I see something pop up on the back left leg. And I'm telling you, watch his latest video. It's there. And tell me that you don't see something pop up on the bottom right corner, just like you would expect to see from, like, a bell-bottom pant or a bell-bottom uh, suit of some kind. Something pops up, and I'm telling you, that is what, to me, was like I was watching it sitting next to him, and I didn't want to be disrespectful at the time, and I never have been. And um, I, I kind of cocked my head, though, and said, oh, what is that? And um, <clears throat> I pointed to it, and he said, oh, it's a twig stuck in the pants or whatever, And um, but it's always bugged me. And so I got kind of obsessed with, okay, I want to know the truth about this one because everybody believes it's real. And um I mean, I'm telling you, I go against the grain. I listened to, all right, don't hate me, Tom Biscardi <laughs> interviewed Bob Hieronymus and Philip Morris in 2006 for about two hours. He grilled them big time for two hours straight, and it's on YouTube. You can hear it now. And that that interview swayed me because these guys' story is rock solid. The other thing is Bob Hieronymus, passed a lie detector test on live television. I'm sorry. He's a cowboy. You don't pass lie detector tests on live television. I'm in technology. I, I couldn't pass a lie detector test. I, don't, I mean, and I understand how that stuff works. There's, I, I just find it really hard to believe he could pass that test. So, so wait, on real live quick, are you calling – you're saying um, – are you telling the audience that uh, <laughs> Bob – was a part of the hoax, or he he was aware of it? Are you saying? I mean, you believe this thing to be a hoax? You're you're saying yeah. Bob was a part of the hoax? Do you believe that? No. Yeah, I, I mean, I do. Not Bob. Well, Bob Hieronymus and Bob Gimlin. I like Bob Gimlin a lot. We're friends. I have a lot mm-hmm. of respect for him. Very nice gentleman. But I I I, I mean I I have integrity too, and I'm not gonna. I mean I, I won't bow to I won't I won't bow to my own integrity. Um, I believe that it's a hoax. I, I sincerely do, and I've never told Bob that. I mean, I wouldn't. I would never do that to his face, just because. Again, you know, he he believes it. A lot of people believe it, but um, I, and my my instinct, my gut, I go with it, and it my gut is telling me there's something wrong there, and there's enough. Uh, I've done enough research on my own to make up my mind on my own, and that's what I always. That's what I do for everything, and it gets me in trouble sometimes, but it's it's reality. You know, I think it's important. Everybody it's needs like to do. I think everybody does. Do your homework. Don't rely on experts. There, you're smart enough to figure this out for yourself. There's enough information out there. You can read. You can listen to people. You can ask some questions and then make up your mind. And that's what we should do. That's the right thing to do. Everybody needs to do that. And we shouldn't just go with the flow. We shouldn't just follow the crowd because everybody thinks it's right. It, that's that's not helpful that's not um i hate to say it's not scientific but it's not it's not it's not productive I mean, we need to we need to investigate things for ourselves and make up our own mind based on the facts we find and that's what i've right. done right yeah that's very honorable and, and and absolutely true uh but i i you know i mean if you feel that uh, do you feel bob gimlin was a part of the hoax i mean 
to say that to his face? I mean, would, do you believe Bob Gillen was a part of the hoax? If it was you a know, hoax, I, I, I personally don't believe I believe that Patty would be a real uh, film. Um, and I've yeah. done my homework. But yeah. um, could I be wrong? Yes. But do you believe Bob Gillen was a part of this hoax? If well, it I was mean, a hoax? Yeah, he would, have to, he would have to be a part of it. I mean, I don't know. Maybe he was kept in the dark for it. I don't know. I mean, it's very, a real possibility. That he was bamboozled as well. There's no reason that that couldn't be the case. Um, but well, he's yeah. definitely a man of integrity and a you know nice nice guy and all. But um, you know I, I'm just gonna I'm gonna do my own homework and come up with things right. as I see them. Yeah, I, and that's honorable. And uh, you know, like I said, I'll, I'm gonna disagree with you there. But Melissa, what is what is your opinion on on the film? You know, it's been discussed time and time again. It, nothing truly is going to be proven from the film. But what what is your opinion on the film? Well, obviously, um, in the homework and research I've done, um, I, I I think it's legit. I think it's real. Um, you know, there's been all these investigations and follow-ups to the area. There's been all kinds of scientific analysis done, um, you know, about the creature in the film, its locomotion, its gait, everything, and the science the, the science that's coming back would indicate that, you know, it's not human. Um you know, it's not a human gait. It's it's and um and the uh the the the, the wound on its leg, that injury to the, the fascia lata or whatever that causes that little hernia or whatever, those are all, you know, just like fascinating little details that are there. Um, that um, all point to it, you know, being a, a real creature, not a suit. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I think, I think it's real. Mm-hmm. And you know, Bill Munns, uh, who I've talked to in length, uh, has done a lot of work on the film, and mm-hmm. you know, he's a he's a you know a film you know guy. He's done work with the Creature of the Black Lagoon and whatnot, and he's done a lot of work on the film. He thinks it's real. Could it be right. wrong? Of course, of course. Uh, I, I, you know, I. It's fascinating, though. That the comparison. It is fascinating. One, it's really fascinating, yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But, Between I his mean, analysis uh, and some of the others, it's just, yeah, it's really incredible to me. I mean, to me, I, I don't see how you how you wouldn't think it was real after watching this. Right. But. And where's the suit nowadays? I mean, where's the suit? Uh, I I think it would have popped up by now, but you know. Um, I'm open to. Uh, I don't. I'll personally say, you know, uh, I I know Bob Kimlin really well. I, if 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 this thing was uh, an elaborate hoax, I'll, I'll, you know, he was not a part of it. Period. But I don't believe it to be a hoax. I believe it to be a legit. That was a, a real Sasquatch film. Could I be wrong? Yes. But uh, I will stake my name on it that Bob Gillen was no part of it. But I just don't see it being a hoax. Uh, I've, I've done my I'll, research. I'll stake my enough. professional, re- <laughs> my rep- <laughs> yeah. professional yeah. reputation. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but no, no, it's an interesting yeah. topic. It's a, it's a heated discussion. And, and truly, it doesn't mean a whole lot nowadays. Uh, a lot of people cling to that. I don't cling to that. Uh, you know, It's not the pillar of my research, bar none. Uh, I I've, I've seen a Sasquatch, uh, or what I assume is a Sasquatch, but and I've talked to enough witnesses out there to know that this subject is a real phenomenon. There's something to it, um, and uh, as Rob, you know, Rob's had his experience. You know, he doesn't put his uh, experience and and whatnot on the Patterson film, as nobody should. Nobody should. Um, is it a piece of evidence? Possibly, but you yeah. don't you don't you don't you don't make that your pillar. Right. I never you know. Have. Right, exactly. Yeah. As, well, no as one funny piece as, of evidence is, is enough. I mean, that's right. Even never. it's 50 years later, and we're still debating, you know, debating whether or not this film was real. And it, it, it's the best evidence that we have in the Bigfoot field. So, I mean, some people have a very emotional attachment to it. But at this point, all we can do is continue to debate and some, you either decide whether or not you think it's real. It, it doesn't, it, it did not confirm the the existence of an unknown species in itself. So Right. Um, the, the Patterson-Gimlin debate among Adair and Godet um, is, is really, um, it's funny uh, to a lot of people to listen to it, but it's also the basis of what Thirds is, is all about. Um, Rob's very passionate that it's a hoax. I'm very passionate that it's 
authentic and yet we remain friends um, and we work together every day and we respect each other's opinion on it at the end of the day and really that's, you know, that's what Surge is all about is that, you know, we can have strong opinions about one, one way or the other but in the end it's just at the pursuit of truth and agreeing to work together and sharing information as we get it. So, um, you know, that's, um, I think that's, I think that's pretty cool that we can that we can be passionate about the extremes and, and still come back and work together. Exactly, exactly. And uh, you know, we're down to the last couple of minutes. What uh, what what future projects you guys have um, you know going on, and what are your goals for the future? Hmm. We just finished a trip. Um. Oh my gosh. I think goals for the future, we really, I wouldn't say we set goals per se. I mean, we obviously, um, we're always out there really hoping to have an encounter. That's kind of, I would say that's our, always our number one objective. Um, everything we do is designed to try to make that happen. Um, but, um, you know, in the future, we we try to do probably five or six intense investigations a year. Um, you know, we don't live in a place like the Pacific Northwest where you can hit the mountains and be in something so amazing. Um, and the weather really kind of dictates for us a lot here too. It can be, get really hot during the summer. So we do five or six, um, four, five or six day trips a year. And I think we've kind of wrapped up for the first half of the year and we're going to wait till after summer before we do another one, um, which will probably be maybe September will be the next big trip we do where we're um, camping because it's just too hot to camp in the summer months here in, in the South. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that's, um, we kind of, and so it's kind of too early to plan anything the first, the second half of the year, basically, I guess. So we usually start planning it maybe June or July. We will be going to um, Beachfoot this year again. Um, we've already locked in our place for that. And so we're looking forward to that trip. That'll be fun. Um, and who knows? Maybe we'll hop a plane and head up to the the north somewhere, and maybe this summer we'll get a chance to do something. Um, but um, other than that, I mean, together that's four or five, six trips a year. Individually, um, you know, we go we go out on our own individually when we can. Um, we have full time jobs like most people, um, but um, you know, it's uh, it's about getting out there as much as we can. Really, what about you, Melissa? <laughs> yeah, our, our our goals for the future are always to find Bigfoot. We haven't found him yet, but we're um we're still looking. Uh, uh, and then yeah, just like Rob said, it, we start winding down about this time of year, and because it it does get pretty hot here and really humid, we we drink the water in in the air, <laughs> we don't breathe it, and um and so it's pretty miserable. But uh yeah, when it starts to cool back down again in the fall, we'll 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 start winding it back up again and, and getting out there. Um I had a, a really um a really awesome encounter on my own. Um I guess it was last last summer there was a cooler weekend and I went further north into Tennessee and had some really really exciting things happen up there. I had my family with me and so I'm I'm kinda anxious to get back up there and, and try that again. If there's a cooler weekend coming up I might be headed up that way. But um but yeah, we're just kind of um, we're kind of at that wind down point in the year, so we'll be ramping it up over the summer. We'll be planning everything out for the rest of the year. But but yeah, we'll we get out there as much as we can, and we um, we're always hoping to have an encounter. Well, Rob and Melissa, we appreciate you joining us today. We're just about out of time. Um, we look forward to following the adventures of the Surge Sasquatch Unlimited Research Group. And I uh, hope to talk to you guys again sometime here in the future. Um, thanks again for joining us. And thanks, everybody, for l- listening in to Monster X. Next week we have Miss Misty Alibau is going to join us. Uh, she is an author and uh, Bigfoot researcher. So uh, until next week, we, we thank you again for joining us. Uh, have a safe – if you're out there, squatching, be safe. Uh, Thanks again for listening to Monster X for out.